Liz Cambage is making her return to the WNBA this season. And I got a lot of DMs from my Brittany Griner video from people asking me to do a breakdown video on how to guard her. For those of you who don't know, Liz Cambage is a 6'8", 220-pound center from Australia who last played in the WNBA in 2013 for the Tulsa Shock. Here she averaged 16 points, 8 rebounds, and 2.5 blocks per game. However, she returned overseas, playing in China the last few years, where she put up just some ridiculous numbers. She was also the first woman to dunk at the Olympics. She's expected to make her return to the Dallas Wings in 2018 and wreak havoc on the WNBA. Anyways, the comments were asking how to defend such a physically superior post player like Cambage. While Griner is very tall, long, and skilled, Cambage is tall, incredibly powerful, athletic, and skilled as well. In other words, if Griner is the Kareem of the WNBA, Cambage is Shaq. Some comments I received said that you do need a junk defense and multiple bigs in order to guard players like Griner or Cambage. So I'm going to use this video as an opportunity to show when not to use the junk defense against a dominant post player. And also show how you can do this while not having bigs at your disposal. So here are some problems I find with junk defenses like the box and one, the triangle and two, and the box and chase. Reason number one. Obviously, your defensive assignments become very predictable and easy to figure out. The harder a play is to learn, the harder it is to scout. And if four-fifths of your team is zoning, it becomes very predictable based on the nature of your defense. Number two, over-adjusting. This is probably the most common coaching mistake. Your strong hand, your primary style of play, will usually be your best chance of winning. A lot of coaches see a great team or player, and what do we do? We begin to overanalyze our opponent, breaking them down in every situation. This leads us to create a game plan specifically for a player that we're only going to play once or twice throughout an entire season. If you do this, your team will simply be a lesser version of themselves, not playing in their style and focusing more on stopping the player than playing how they normally would. The third and final reason is that you're sub-communicating to your team that this player is better than they are. You're telling them that you believe in that player more than them. So instead, your goal should be to impose your own style and force the other team to adjust to you. So before we get into it, I'm going to tell you why the box and chase was so psychologically effective for Louisville. Number one, it was specific to Griner's mentality. They got in her head. If you try to box and want a guy like Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan or one of those uh, cold assassins, you're going to be in serious trouble because they will rise to that challenge. Griner, for whatever reason, struggled with it. And most of it was from a psychological aspect. They knew she had a history of losing her composure. The other reason why it was effective is because Baylor heavily focused on Griner. She was their leading scorer. She was their go-to player. Their offense was predicated off of getting her touches. So when a team has only one option in a weak supporting cast, this is probably one of the only times I would recommend uh, using a junk defense. Not to say that Baylor was a one-player show, but they did struggle to run their offense without leaning heavily on Griner. Three, Walls had his entire team buy into the underdog role. However, instead of thinking we have to change the game plan we've been running all season because Griner is too talented, it was reframed to view themselves as almost like a rebellion attempting to take down a tyrant. This could be seen in how they all bought into their roles, even if it was just to go out there and foul Griner. This sacrificial style for the altruistic good is a natural human instinct, I think, when faced with confronting the oppressor. Even the way they seem to attack Brittany Griner personally show that they viewed themselves as the good guys and her the villain. The other reason, the box and chase also had a novel component. Nobody had really seen that before. A lot of teams aren't preparing for it, they're not going through it all season long, and uh, nobody knew exactly how they were going to execute it. It wasn't as predictable as the box and one or triangle and two, or things they probably faced a lot uh, having a player like Griner on their team. As Mind Smash, a great YouTube channel on uh, competition psychology, I'll put a link below. Anyways, Mind Smash has a good quote saying, through understanding yin and yang, if no one else does it, it becomes a psychological blind spot. And so the person who masters it exploits the new loophole formed. Back to Cambridge. My game plan would be to stick to my strong hand, my primary go-to offense, primary go-to defense, and make small adjustments. The first adjustment I'd make was take away her primary option. Cambage loves to finish with her right. From the film I've seen, even when she catches it on the left, she'll still go up with her right hand. This is her plan A, so your goal is simply to make this difficult for her. Being aware of her tendencies will definitely help. However, don't go too far beyond this. If you do that, 
You'll take your players out of their game due to overthinking. Don't micromanage or overanalyze all of her moves. Remember, no matter how good Cambage is, she's only one player and five beats one every single time. Another option from the previous video is to platoon effectively. Give her as many fresh looks and fresh legs as possible. And no, you do not need a ton of bigs. As Marcus Smart showed in the NBA guarding guys like Przingis and Rondo guarding guys like LeBron, they just need to be active, strong, stay low and maintain a wide stance and stay under the person they're guarding's knees. If you take the feet out of the equation and if you take the legs out of the equation, you'll have the advantage. Another adjustment is to use your fouls intelligently when you platoon. I'm not going to go over that in this video because we already covered it in the last one, but I'll put a link below. So those would be my adjustments for dealing with Cambage. Remember this one thing. With all overpowered bigs, they can be exploited just as much as they can exploit. If it were up to me, I would run my four strongest perimeter players and shooters and just platoon players in to guard her and make sure they were aware of her tendency to go right. In doing this, you're essentially trading threes and open layups from your entire lineup for easy Cambage buckets under the basket. If you're running a five out with shooters everywhere, there's absolutely no way Cambage can step out and cover the perimeter without being burned. However, if you platoon, foul, and take away her primary go-tos, you're going to put yourself in position to come out on top of this trade. The next thing, leak your fastest two guards every time. This becomes the great equalizer in this matchup. As the primary risk for trading threes for low post mismatches is the fact that the latter team will have more offensive rebounds and thus more possessions. However, if you keep three players focused solely on boxing out and two players leak every time, you'll get your own share of open high percentage baskets in transition. Obviously, these guards could hang around and try and fight on the boards as well. However, they'll probably maybe get one to two offensive rebounds per game each. So as you can see, that's just not a good trade. Instead, leak them out and get some cheap buckets on the other end. As long as Cambage is in, you'll be guaranteed to have the numbers in your favor in transition the majority of the time. You're also forcing her to work in an area that would be her most challenging, running up and down the floor. If you stay the course even through shooting droughts and giving up easy buckets and offensive rebounds to Cambage, your team can and will win this style war. And when this happens, players like Cambage become liabilities. This can be seen as the NBA style has shifted towards three-pointers and positionless offense. Clogging traditional centers who used to be fixtures in the league, like Greg Ostertag, Jason Collins, Dikembe Mutombo, Roy Hibbert, etc., have become almost extinct. I hope you guys enjoyed today's analysis. Thank you for sticking to the end of the video, and as always, please like, subscribe, and share.